It's always worse than you think, and it takes a while to investigate it. So uh, some sort of clarity on what the policy should be in terms of who should be informed and who is going to be on the hook for either making the decision about whether to disclose or not disclose uh, would be very helpful. And a lot of companies have data breach response plans. They should. But getting some guidance on how you can structure that in a way that won't be considered concealment, I think, would be very helpful. I'm Stephanie Pell, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 20th, 2022. On October 5th, 2022, Joe Sullivan, Uber's former chief security officer and a former federal prosecutor, was found guilty of obstruction of justice and misprison of a felony. These charges arose from what the Department of Justice characterized as Sullivan's attempted cover-up of a 2016 hack of Uber. The Sullivan case has created some consternation in the cybersecurity community. Kellen Dwyer, partner at the law firm of Alston and Byrd, argues in a recent lawfare piece that the Sullivan prosecution threatens to undermine the positive working relationship between DOJ and the tech sector. I sat down with Kellen to talk about the Sullivan case. We discussed the specific charges for which Sullivan was convicted, how those charges blur the lines between covering up a data incident and merely declining to report it, and how, in order to facilitate timely reporting of serious cybersecurity incidents to the FBI, the DOJ should clarify certain aspects of its charging policy to address concerns raised by the Sullivan case. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 20th. Kellen Dwyer on the fallout from the conviction of Uber's former chief security officer. Kellen, before we get into the substance of the recent lawfare piece that you wrote, I think it's useful to note that you come to your critique of how DOJ charged the Sullivan case, having prosecuted or litigated a number of computer crimes matters while at the Department of Justice. Could you speak briefly about your background? Sure. So I joined uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in the Eastern District of Virginia in 2014 after having been a litigation associate at Kirkland and Ellis. Um, and in EDVA, they put you right into your unit that you're going to be in. So I started right off in the cyber unit, uh, spent six years prosecuting a variety of cybercrime cases. And I then went over to the National Security Division of Maine Justice in 2020, where I was uh, in leadership and in charge of cyber policy uh, as well as appellate issues. I'm now a partner at Alston and Bird, uh, where I do uh, cyber litigation and white collar defense. So let's talk about the facts of the Sullivan case. Uh, Sullivan was a former federal prosecutor from the same U.S. Attorney's mm-hmm. Office that charged and convicted him of the conduct he engaged in while he was Uber's chief security officer. Mm-hmm. What were the charges for which he was convicted, and what were the facts that provided the basis for the prosecution by DOJ? Sure. So the charges were obstruction of justice and misprison of a felony. The The timeline here in terms of the facts is very important. Sullivan joins Uber in 2014, and they had already had a previous data breach, and the FTC was investigating it. And that frequently happens uh, When a company has a breach, you report it to the FTC or state AGs, and they might launch an investigation into, okay, were your data security practices good enough, or or are you in some way at fault for having this happen? So he's in the middle of that. The FTC issues a long uh, CID, Civil Investigative Demand, asking a number of questions about Uber's data security practices, including uh, whether they had other data breaches in the past. That is answered, and Sullivan's working on this, and Uber gives the answer in 2015, In 2016, Sullivan is deposed uh, about Uber's data security practices. In November of 2016, 10 days later, he gets an email from hackers saying, essentially, we've breached our system and accessed sensitive data. And the charges come for how he reacted to that email. He did not disclose it to the FTC. He did disclose it to the then CEO of Uber, to uh, the in-house counsel who's assigned to his team, and a couple other people. Uh, they decide they're not going to disclose to the FTC, that instead they're going to pay what some would call a ransom, they call it a bug bounty, which we'll get to in a minute, to the hackers in exchange for them uh, deleting the data that they stole and keeping quiet about the whole matter. And that led to the two charges. The first charge is obstruction of justice. And the theory there is, as far as I can tell, there wasn't an explicit false statement that he made to the FTC, but it was that he obstructed their investigation by not 
coming and updating them. And I think it's very relevant that the government say, well, the FTC asked about other breaches. You said there are no other breaches, or at least didn't mention this one. And you had a duty while that investigation was ongoing to come back to us and say, well, actually, now we've, we've had one. So that duty, in theory, is ongoing? For for what period of time or, or do we know? You know, I don't know exactly what the government's theory is here. And, and that's part of what's getting com- companies so uncomfortable. Because again, I mean, it, to kind of borrow a bedrock principle of securities law, and I think it's the same in cyber breach reporting, silence, absent and duty to disclose is not misleading. So there is no general federal law which requires disclosure, and we'll get to that in a minute. So where does the duty come from? And I think for at least for the obstruction charge, the duty, according to the government, comes from this ongoing investigation and the fact that you were specifically asked about this in the whole course of conduct where Sullivan is still involved in responding to the FTC investigation when he knows about this breach and he's keeping it quiet. So I think that was enough on the government's theory for uh, him to have a duty to bring it to their attention. And he was also charged and convicted of uh, misprison of a felony. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the charge that's really got a lot of folks in the cybersecurity community nervous. Um, so misprison, it's a very old crime. It's a, actually a common law crime that predates modern police forces. And the idea was that if you were aware of a felony uh, in England and you had an obligation to, quote, make a hue and cry, uh, and that's still in Black's Law Dictionary, you make a hue and cry and you have to uh, go to authorities and report the felony. It was codified by the first Congress in 1790 and is now uh, 18 U.S.C. 4. And what it says is that it is a crime to be aware of a federal felony, to know it's a felony, to not report it to authorities, and to engage in some act of concealment. Um, So really, it's the act of concealment that's doing a lot of work there. And the question which we'll get to is, well, if you're a company, you're aware of a data breach, that's normally going to be a federal felony, and you choose not to report it, assuming you weren't required to under the regulations. So what is the what acts of concealment can you or what can you do before you reach to the point of an act of concealment and now you've committed uh, a felony? I think that raises just just a number of questions that that has a lot of people um, scratching their heads. And I want to come back to that. But as you note in your piece, this case marks the first time that a company executive faced prosecution over a data incident. And I think one of the other notable aspects of this case, as you explain in your lawfare piece, is that Sullivan attempted to conceal the new hacking incident that occurred during the course of the FTC investigation of Uber by arranging for a $100,000 payment to hackers. Had the hackers sign a non-disclosure agreement, or NDA, and made them promise not to reveal the incident and to falsely state that they did not exfiltrate sensitive information, Mm -hmm. which they did. And Sullivan, as I understand it, engaged in these concealment activities under the auspices of Uber's bug bounty program. In other words, he pretended that the hack was actually a bug bounty disclosure. For those listeners who may not be as familiar, can you explain what a bug bounty program is and why companies use bug bounty programs? Sure. So bug bounty program, uh, normally formally known as a, a vulnerability disclosure program, is when a company basically also offers a reward and says that if you are an ethical hacker, what we call the white hat hackers, and you can find a vulnerability or a bug uh, or, or some sort of way to hack into our systems and prove it to us, if you instead of stealing our data, <laughs> come to us and disclose it to us so we can make our security better, uh, you know, we'll pay you a fair reward for that. And companies do it. Uh, you know, even some agencies of the federal government, uh, including DHS, have bug bounty programs. Uh, and it's DOD gener- has them. DOD. And it's considered good security practice because um, you know, the nature of cybersecurity is that you, you, know, you have to plug every single hole and you can never be sure. So having someone test that and come to your attention and bring that to your attention if there is a hole uh, is, of course, very valuable. And I think also we'd like to incentivize a lot of typically tend to be young people with hacking skills to use them uh, for, for good and not for evil. So uh, generally, it's considered to be a positive program if administered correctly. So you raise some valid concerns then with the way DOJ chose to charge this case in your piece. And, and we're going to get to them. But I first want to ask your thoughts about how Sullivan, Uber's former chief security officer, chose to manipulate the 2016 hack into a bug bounty disclosure. 
Do you see it as problematic conduct, you know, the kind that undermines the very goals of the bug bounty program that you just talked about? Sure. So, and of course, I should be clear, I mean, the piece isn't a defense of Sullivan per se, as much as it is kind of raising the implications of of the charge. Uh, Certainly, I think it's good advice to corporate executives in general to be honest and to follow your own procedures, because when you violate either of those two, uh, you can find yourself in trouble in a number of ways. So I think the most problematic aspect of Sullivan's behavior is the NDA that he had the hacker sign, which the NDA itself, we can debate whether that's a problem, have to ask them to be quiet about it. Um, but putting false information in there, which says that they were essentially ethical hackers and that they didn't exfiltrate any sensitive customer data, that is problematic uh, because it at least raises the specter that at some point that would be given to a regulator or to, uh, you know, produced in discovery. And certainly that would be a major problem. I don't think that part actually happened. Um, but the fact that he's engaging in dishonesty and kind of it looks like putting it through the bug bounty program instead of treating it as a ransom payment in order to kind of keep quiet the hack. So that was certainly uh, not a good look for Sullivan. Uh, whether that rises to a federal crime, I think, is a, is a separate question. But as the, even if it, in theory, doesn't rise mm-hmm. to a level of a federal crime, as a matter of policy, mm-hmm. it's concerning when you are subverting, arguably, a tool that is when appropriately administered, meant to protect companies mm-hmm. from from malicious intrusions and data breaches. Do you agree with that? Or? I, I do agree with that. But again, I think it's just a matter – I'm less concerned of whether you're violating the company's policy. Because remember, the CEO approved this. So the CEO can tell you that we're not going to follow this policy in this case. But it's really about treat, being honest and transparent, right? Companies make payments to white hack hackers under the bug bounty program. They make payments sometimes to black hat hackers as ransoms. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in between where it does go through the bug bounty program where maybe it's a, what we would call a gray hat hacker. So uh, for me, it's less of a concern kind of, you know, what pot of money do you take the payment out of? And more, are you at least being transparent internally of how you document this? Even if you choose not to report to authorities, we certainly can't be creating a false impression or false documentation. So as you say in your piece and and have have mentioned in this conversation, the Sullivan verdict has raised some consternation in the broader uh, cybersecurity community and within companies. And one of the main concerns you raise in your piece is with the way that DOJ charged the case because you say that it blurs the lines between covering up a data incident and merely declining to report it. And the verdict in the case, as you note, follows President Biden's recently signing cybersecurity legislation called the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2022, a mouthful. Cirquia. Cirquia. And it requires this legislation, Cirquia, requires certain critical infrastructure companies to report certain data security incidents to the government. But of course, that legislation won't take effect until DHS finalizes implementing regulations, and that won't likely occur until probably 2025. Mm -hmm. So you say in your piece that the new critical infrastructure reporting legislation represents a loss of turf (laughs) uh, by DOJ in, in this war or turf war with DHS. Can you give us the background on this claim that you make about the turf war and how it plays into your argument that the Sullivan case blurs the lines between covering up a data incident and merely declining to report it, which federal law would not have currently required Uber to do, as Mm -hmm. I understand it? Yeah. So a bit of background here. Um, As I mentioned earlier, there is no general federal statute requiring companies to disclose data breaches. There are state statutes that require disclosure, uh, sometimes to victims, sometimes to state AGs. There are sector-specific federal laws, uh, like if there's patient health information involved, you might have to disclose to HHS. If you're a public company now, you might have to make an 8K. Um, But there's no general statute. And DOJ has wanted one for a long time. Uh, A lot of folks in a lot of agencies and folks in national security have wanted a reporting law. Congress tried several times and failed over the last six or seven years. And it wasn't until this year that uh, they finally passed the data breach reporting law. A lot of it has to do with solar winds, which we won't get into. But 
Interestingly, DOJ comes out and opposes it after wanting it for so long. And you have statements that it will make us less safe. Uh, that's a quote both from Chris Ray uh, and from the Deputy Attorney General, Elise Monaco. So the reason, as I understand it, is because the reporting that is going to be required is going to go to CISA and then not to FBI. CISA does need to share it with FBI within 24 hours. Um, I actually think DOJ's readings aren't quite as – the reasons for opposing aren't quite as petty uh, as you might think. But that's a little bit of an aside. I think the important point for the Sullivan case is that Xarkia creates this process now where um, there's going to be formal notice and comment rulemaking, and CIS has already begun it with an RFI to industry asking for feedback, where CIS is going to put implementing regulations that tell companies exactly which companies are covered by this, when they have to report data breaches or ransom payments, what the content of those reports will be. Um, how they're going to deconflict that obligation with other obligations that already exist, like the ones I discussed and others. So you have a real contrast here between CISA doing this regulation and imposing these reporting duties through notice and comment rulemaking. And after a congressional statute where we all kind of debated and thought about this, um, and DOJ doing you know what some might call regulation by enforcement, right? That they're saying, well, actually, we didn't need to create the statute that took us seven years to do. We could just use the 1790 statute to tell companies, well, if you're aware of a data breach, maybe you're not required to report it. But if you don't, and if you do any act of concealment, whatever that means, then maybe you've committed a felony. Um, and I think a lot of companies, certainly I'll, I'll give some free advice here. I'll be telling my clients, Certainly, if you're going to be engaged in a ransom payment, that might be considered an act of concealment. So my advice uh, would be for this reason and, and often for many others as well, that you would want to disclose the existence of the breach, if not the payment, to the FBI before you do it so you can't be accused of misprison of trying to to cover up that felony. And when you get to lawyers advising that, you see what DLJ has done, whether wittingly or unwittingly. They've just jumped ahead of CISA and created uh, effectively an obligation to at least disclose breaches uh, in the event that you're going to make a ransom payment. Um, there may be other instances where you could be worried about an act of concealment and you might want to disclose. So they really are, if not creating a duty to, to disclose, um, at least articulating one that, that most of us uh, in this industry weren't thinking about misprison uh, until this case. Now, you do say in your piece that sort of following, I, I, I guess, the outcome of the turf war, the DOJ mm. has been working, DOJ and FBI, mm -hmm. have been working very hard to build trust with companies so that when serious cyber incidents occur, they feel comfortable disclosing mm -hmm. that matter to the FBI. That, of course, helps the FBI disclose information and potentially protect mm -hmm. other companies. But, but you caution that these charging decisions, as played out in the Sullivan case, whether intended or not, mm. may actually backfire in that building of, of trust. And you touched upon that in your last answer, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So I think DOJ and FBI deserve a lot of praise for the outreach that they've done to industry. I've been a part of a lot of these talks where they're reaching out to attorneys and companies that are involved in cyber incident response and you know, hosting roundtables, having discussions of how can we do this better, how can we cooperate more. When I've worked with the FBI, which I frequently do for my clients, they have provided excellent service. So they have actually built up a lot of trust. And their message, which predates Cirquia, but I think I've noticed anecdotally that post Cirquia, you see more of this FBI charm offensive because they want to make sure that, they're, that companies are still going to report to them even though now Sarkia kind of incentivizes you to go through DHS instead. and But the message from FBI has long been, if you are a company and you're hacked, we're going to treat you as a victim. We're, you know, FTC, state AGs, other agencies might investigate you, you know, civil attorneys might sue you and, and try to see what, you know, what you did to kind of bring this on. But we, FBI, are going to treat you as a victim. And our only goal is to figure out who did it and bring them to justice. That message is a little complicated now, right? Now it's we're normally going to treat you as a victim, but there might be some instance in which you're treated as a target. And at least as of now, and part of my thesis we'll get to is that we can maybe solve this problem by CSIP issuing some guidance. But at least as of now, there's this sort of nebulous duty that maybe you violated and that no one knows exactly how far it extends, you know, that could have the effect. And again, I advise my clients that that should have the effect of disclosed to FBI so you don't have to be worried about misprison. But, you know, a lot of people, and I think those of us who are prosecutors, you kind of forget this, 
Uh, they're afraid of FBI agents. Even attorneys, that is very, you know, you may never meet one in your life. You just know them from movies. So there is already sort of this reluctance to get FBI involved in a crisis response. And then when you throw in that, well, maybe at least in some circumstances you could be prosecuted, that is very scary for a lot of people. And it, it could have the effect of, of them kind of clamming up and not wanting to get FBI involved. So what I hear you saying is not that companies should totally run and not report mm -hmm. these incidents to the FBI, but to sort of, I don't want to say mend the relationship, but, mm -hmm. to, but to create more comfort and security, both with lawyers who represent companies and the companies themselves. There are some questions now post-Sullivan verdict that DOJ could answer that could create a, a, a greater comfort level. And, and you talk about these questions in your piece, and I want to turn to them now. You focus first on issues surrounding incomplete cooperation concerning a data security incident. Mm -hmm. What's at issue here and what needs to be clarified? Well, I think... When you talk about the DOJ's obstruction theory, in this case, Sullivan was accused of obstructing the FTC, but the reason that he obstructed was kind of this incomplete cooperation, right? That they answered questions, uh, I think they were truthful at the time, at least even on the DOJ's theory, but then had a, kind of had a duty to update the answers to those questions after the fact. So I do think it's a question that I, I will get from clients, well, that if we, if we go to FBI, what are we going to voluntarily what are we going to be required to tell them? Because um, sometimes and frequently, there'll be information that you can share and information that you can't. And again, I think normally the relationship is good and we make that clear up front that like, look, we're going to be as cooperative as we can, but there's some things that we won't be able to provide, at least without a subpoena and so forth. But I think that that is kind of one concern of just companies wanting to make sure that like there's not, you know, no good deed's going to go unpunished, right? That if you go to the FBI and you provide them with information that you can but for instance, frequently companies don't disclose to FBI if they made a ransom payment. They might disclose the breach, but the payment is very sensitive. Is that going to be considered incomplete cooperation, you know, a material omission uh, that could give rise to an obstruction charge? And you know, in some sense, I don't think so. Again, like most, almost all, I would say, federal prosecutors are operating in good faith. And I, I certainly don't think that they're looking to kind of get people on technicalities. But again, I'm more comfortable as a former federal prosecutor. I think some of the clients who have never interacted with FBI before, who are dealing with a crisis, who are dealing with sensitive information, um, I think just having a little more assurance of knowing, you know, exactly what circumstances are you going to cross a line could be very helpful to the relationship. And then you address the issue of misprison of a felony, which mm -hmm. you find to be, you, you argue, is the most sort of problematic concerning charge mm -hmm. as it occurred in the Sullivan case. What's at issue here and what needs to be clarified in your view? Right. So again, anytime you now are dealing with a data breach, you're aware of a felony. And if you're not reporting it, the only thing you, more you need to be a felon yourself is to engage in an act of concealment. So, so I would like to know exactly what does DOJ consider to be potential acts of concealment in this context. And you know, companies frequently make ransom payments. No one loves that. The companies themselves don't like to make them. They, sometimes they feel like they have to. But I think the government has never seriously considered making payments illegal. Um, so at least as long as we're in this circumstance, I just think you know, if we're going to make payments illegal or if we're going to require payments to be disclosed, as we are under Sarkia in some circumstances, that we should be explicit about that and, and not find out after the fact that they were illegal. So, so that is certainly a concern. In particular, you know, kind of old school ransomware was we're going to lock up your data, encrypt it until you pay. The kind of new school is that even if you can get around that, we're going to extort you and say that all, all these ransomware gangs have what they call shaming sites. We're going to publish your company's name and all your sensitive data on the shaming site. So if you're paying a criminal to not put you on the shaming site, well, that looks a lot like an affirmative act of concealment of a felony. Um, so I think certainly some clarity of how this theory might or hopefully might not be applied to ransom payments, I think, would give companies um, a, a lot more comfort. You also raise the scenario of vulnerability disclosure programs mm -hmm. and that more clarity post the Sullivan verdict around the application of misprison of a felony could help there. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So it's pretty common to use a nondisclosure agreement 
if you're making a payment to a bug bounty because, you know, companies, of course, don't want it to be publicized that they were hacked or that at least they could have been hacked. Um, they certainly don't want to be publicized what the vulnerability was, right? You don't want to tell the bad guys uh, about it uh, or even kind of advertise that your security maybe isn't that great because that might encourage more hackers to uh, to target you. So it is unclear from the Sullivan case what work that NDA is playing in the misprison charge. The prosecutors focus on both that there was an MDA, you know, you're paying the hackers to be quiet, and also the um, the NDA had some false information in it. That, and the false information, that's easy to tell companies, don't put false information in the NDAs. But that wasn't required for the misprison charge, right? Misprison doesn't require a false statement. It doesn't require any statement at all to government. It just requires concealment. And NDAs, by their very nature, conceal. <laughs> They're telling you not to disclose something. It's not a pro-disclosure agreement. It's, an, it's a non-disclosure agreement. So I think companies like to know, can we still use these in our vulnerability disclosure programs? And you might say, well, as long as you're using your bug bounty to pay ethical hackers, then there was no crime to cover up in the first place. Uh, but I think in practice, it's more complicated than that. That Sometimes there are gray hats. Sometimes a technical intrusion might have been committed if they were outside the four corners of the what was authorized under the bug bounty. So I, I'm not sure that's a, a full answer for companies that are, are really trying to get this right and certainly don't want to face criminal liability. So then you also, in your piece, reflect upon restrictions on disseminating information about an intrusion. How would clarification post the Sullivan verdict help build trust with respect to, to this kind of issue? Yeah, you know, that part was, I think, concerning to a lot of people as well, because the prosecutors kind of found a bunch of internal statements where Sullivan had said, we need to keep this close hold. We need, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but we need to only disclose to certain people and so forth. Uh, and that was kind of seen as evidence of the cover up. But I mean, Sullivan did disclose to a CEO and he disclosed to the, the attorney whose job it is to advise on data breach disclosures. So I think, again, it's common for companies to limit who has information about a breach afterwards. You do that for attorney-client privilege reasons. You do that for just kind of controlling information before you even know what happened because you never know for sure. And you it's always worse than you think, and it takes a while to investigate it. So uh, some sort of clarity on what the policy should be in terms of who should be informed and who is going to be on the hook for either making the decision about whether to disclose or not disclose uh, would be very helpful. And a lot of companies have data breach response plans. They should. But getting some guidance on how you can structure that in a way that won't be considered concealment, I think, would be very helpful. And I think it's worth noting that the kind of guidance you're asking for, you know, wouldn't be a new effort, per se, by the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. they, they have written guidance policies, mm -hmm. for example, on charging policy and decisions regarding the Computer Fraud and mm -hmm. Abuse Act. And, and fair to say that is that is helped companies and hackers understand sort of what kinds of conduct are the most concerning that would that would likely lead to a, a prosecution mm -hmm. or certainly an investigation. Yeah, so CSIPS, uh, the computer fraud section of Maine Justice, issues a lot of this guidance. This isn't necessarily a new idea by me, um, and they do it particularly when. There are issues that are unclear, issues that are important to industry where they want clarity. And CSIPS is very good at that, that they uh, do have their finger on the pulse in terms of what industry is concerned about, and uh, they have the ability to kind of give guidance. So if they could do that in this circumstance, I think that it would make a lot of CISOs um, and cybersecurity councils sleep better at night. And and I want to come back to sort of the role that CSIPS plays in in both providing guidance, but also policing, if you will, the kinds of charges that, that are brought sometimes mm -hmm. in a minute. But I, I do want to ask you about sort of another point that or argument you make in your piece. And, and, and that is, at the end of the day, you argue that there is going to be rarely, if ever, a situation that a misprison mm -hmm. of a felony charge would be appropriate for the kinds of activities we've mm -hmm. been discussing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So first, just on the face of it, I mean, the idea of taking a 1790 statute and applying it to data breach response, you know, 
you should give us pause in, in the, just in the first instance when someone pitches that idea to you. But secondly, yeah, you know, I do wonder whether misprison is ever appropriate in data breach circumstances, that you have a regulatory scheme. Uh, you have the state laws, you have the sector-specific laws, and now we're going to have Sarkia, which is going to give detailed guidance on exactly when you have to disclose. So if a company violates that, by all means, there's civil suits, there's regulatory investigations to go after them. And then, you know, if a company engages in obstruction, so you ask, well, DOJ has obstruction, right? So if there's false information being given to DOJ, evidence being destroyed, et cetera, that can be prosecuted as obstruction. But assuming there's not obstruction and there's not violation of the regulatory scheme, it's really hard to think of instances in which it's nonetheless necessary or appropriate to charge misprison. And when you go down that road, it's just such a broad statute. I think it just raises more concerns and maybe more harm than good. So as we begin to wrap things up, as you reflect upon the way that DOJ charged this case, do you think this is a situation where perhaps the broader implications of the charging theories that were used were not considered when the case was indicted? Or or is this a situation where maybe the landscape of regulation wasn't apparent yet and, and now perhaps there is a disconnect with the charging theory and the kinds of policy that the Biden administration is trying to make happen through recent cybersecurity legislation. Right. So, I mean, I think the prosecutors, you know, look, they're smart people. And so they certainly were aware of the implications in terms of that they are, if not creating, at least articulating requirements that companies have to follow in terms of breach reporting. And we know that because some of the this issue was raised to some extent in the pretrial briefings, uh, at least as it related to a wire fraud charge, which was even broader than the two we discussed that DLJ eventually um, voluntarily dismissed. So they were aware of the issue. Uh, and in the press release, uh, they were kind of proud of it. And I put some of the statements in my lawfare piece where the U.S. attorney effectively says that this verdict means, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but this verdict means that companies uh, have an obligation to report when their customer data is breached. So they were aware of it in that sense, um, but certainly they couldn't have been aware when they charged the case that Cirquia was going to be passed two years later so that there was going to be a statute on this. And, and I also think maybe they didn't fully appreciate how this would affect industry and almost in a way that's not their fault, but like institutionally, DOJ and certainly individual U.S. attorney's offices are not CISA, right? They don't do notice and comment rulemaking and get all this input from industry about exactly how this this um, obligation they're creating might conflict with other obligations and how it might affect industry or what clarity industry might want. Of course, they're not institutionally set up for that. So I think that's really the concern and uh, something that CSIPs can potentially remedy because um, while they, CSIPs can't do notice and comment rulemaking, uh, they do have a much better um, sense of what industry wants, and they can issue guidance to clarify things in the way that an individual AUSA or U.S. Attorney's Office can't. be interesting to know whether CSIPS was consulted about this case at the time. It would, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> look, I think they probably were consulted. They certainly read about it in the news long before this happened. But interestingly, the regulations don't require it. The regulations require consultation with CSIPS if it's a CFAA charge, you know, if it's a charge under the hacking statute. Uh, but this, of course, was a charge under obstruction and misprison. I would think that an AUSA, U.S. Maps would still want to go to CSIPS for something this important. So I imagine they were at some point. But I think another thing to understand, and you know this, obviously, being at DOJ, is that the Justice Department is probably the least hierarchical federal agency, right? That there's so much authority in the U.S. Attorney's offices. Uh, they might build the case for a couple of years before they come to CSIPS for consultation uh, or support. And CSIPS is very reticent, and not just CSIPS, anyone at Maine Justice is pretty reticent about then telling the U.S. Attorney's Office, no, you can't do this charge. Uh, much more frequently, they're going to give advice, they're going to raise concerns, but it's really a kind of bottom-up enforcement process, which is sometimes good, but uh, then a top-down where CSIPS is saying, geez, you know, let's go out and bring a case where we can kind of impose more obligations on companies, that it is not uh, that sort of regime. Great. Well, Thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a really interesting discussion, and I, I think you've provided some critical mm -hmm. insight um, into understanding and interpreting the Sullivan verdict. All right. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get an ad-free version of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter 
at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.